Welcome and thank you for joining us for a discussion of three important topics in second language acquisition theory, interlanguage, fossilization, and translanguaging. Now that you have analyzed some of the differences and common errors made by native speakers and English learners, we will go on to look at some aspects of second language acquisition theory that may be causing those errors for ELs. Interlanguage is a term coined by Dr. Larry Selinker. It describes the extensive trial and error process that learners go through to slowly succeed in approximating the language systems used by native speakers. Interlanguage lies between the learner's first language and the language being learned. And it is the learner's best attempt to provide order and structure to the language learning process. This interlanguage often preserves some features of their first language and can also overgeneralize some language to writing and speaking rules. The errors they make are often stepping stones to learning and are a natural occurrence in students' language development. Pronunciation, or accent, is a feature of a learner's interlanguage that can clearly distinguish them from a native speaker and can sometimes confuse the listener. If someone has a strong accent or often mispronounces words, listeners can perceive them as having a low level of English. For adults, native-like pronunciation takes a long time, if ever, to achieve. Teachers should monitor patterns in language errors and address them by designing instructional activities that target them, but do not necessarily correct them as they occur. There were several examples of interlanguage in the activity you just completed. Let's take a look at just a few. Martin Luther King Jr. was born in January 15, 1929. Here you see the correction where you use in in a month or a year, but you use on for days and dates. In our second example, most people want to avoid to catch the flu. You see the correction is that certain verbs like avoid must be followed by a gerund, the ing form, not an infinitive. In our final interlanguage example, you'll see the correction here is that equipment is a non-count noun and should not be used as a plural. Also, use much, not many, to precede non-count nouns. Sometimes ELs know the correct grammar or pronunciation, but they can have ingrained error patterns that are difficult to get rid of. These patterns reflect fossilization, or frozen development. For those who do not receive regular feedback that would help them to distinguish between their interlanguage and their target language, this idea of fossilization can pose a sizable barrier to second language acquisition. Consider using these teaching strategies to help students overcome their fossilization errors. Draw gentle attention to mistakes and their impact on effective communication. EL should not be repeatedly singled out in front of the class for these mistakes. Simply ask, could you please clarify that for me, or I'm not quite sure what you mean, to increase understanding and communication. Provide one-on-one -on -one coaching, if at all possible. Model correct forms regularly and occasionally point out corrections. Provide strategic visual tools, such as grammar charts, color coding, or t-charts to help reinforce correct forms. And shift from problem to solution orientation. Let the student own the pattern, unravel the issue, and arrive at possible solutions to self-correct. Look at this example of a common fossilization from the previous activity. She visit her sister every weekend. Here we see the correction is by adding an S to the verb in the third person singular present tense. Take a moment, maybe pause the video to consider other examples of fossilized errors that your ELs make. 
Additionally, native speakers can have speech patterns that are also difficult to get rid of, but are usually different than those of ELs. For example, she invited my friend and I to the party. You'll see that the correction here corrects the object of the preposition to my friend and me. Again, take just a moment to think about some other repeated errors that native speakers make. As we move our discussion to the topic of translanguaging, I'd first like you to consider these questions. Do your students use their native L1 in your class? Do you want them to use only English? And why only English? How can the use of L1 complement the learning that happens in English? These questions address the second language acquisition concept of translanguaging introduced by Ophelia Garcia in 2016. Translanguaging states that it's advantageous to allow ELs to access their L1s in certain situations like planning, writing drafts, explaining reasoning, working through new concepts, so you may want to consider this when making grouping or pairing decisions. While maintaining language production in English is the goal, consider allowing students to use their first language to process content. ELs are more effective writers if they are allowed to pre-write using all language features and abilities they can access. And ELs will have fuller comprehension of reading texts rendered in English if they are allowed to discuss ideas deeply or research topics using language in the ways that they prefer, regardless of whether the same language as the text. Putting language practices from L1 and L2 alongside each other makes it possible for bilingual students to explicitly notice language features and provides the awareness needed to develop linguistic abilities. Consider the two questions below. What do I want students to know and be able to do as a result of my instruction? And will using both languages help them to get there? Some examples of how you might foster translanguaging in order to help your students with the content of the lesson and meet the desired outcomes include think, pair in any language and share in English listen in English and discuss in any language, read in English and discuss in any language, brainstorm in any language and write in English, read the partner's writing in English and discuss revisions and edits in any language. Consider these reflection questions. Have you ever provided any of these opportunities for translanguaging? Would you consider using them? And what are the pros and cons of fostering translanguaging in your class? Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation about interlanguage, fossilization, and translanguaging.